take, Wendy. <laughs> I know. I know but... <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I, hear lo Hello. <laughs> I think I hear little voices or something. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's here or not. Rosalie, I, I love your, your, your let's song. Let's all remember. Let's all. I love that. Yeah. Guys, let's all remember to mute when we're not on and to unmute when we are. Cool. I'll try. <laughs> Should we all just mute right now? Would that be That's easier? That's probably a good idea. Yeah. Okay. And then Karen, uh, Karen can get it. Mm -hmm. I feel like I have no art on my walls because I'm in my spare bedroom and somebody <laughs> just moved out. <laughs> All right, so the, the numbers have stabilized. They will go up, but it's two minutes after, so I think we should start. Okay, great. All right. So welcome one and all to one of the final programs for this year's Rochester Read, Celebrating Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. Um, there's one more event actually at Ganondigan and another one more book discussion at a library and you can find those at wab.org. And I'm really pleased about tonight's event, uh, reciprocating the gift because so much of Braiding Sweetgrass is, is about acknowledging gifts and giving back. So um, I give um, uh, uh, credit to Wendy for uh, envisioning tonight's program. And I'm going to start with a land acknowledgement. Writers and books would like to call attention to the complex and troubled history of the lands on which we live and work, whether you are here in Rochester or joining us from other parts of the country. We acknowledge that we are founded on and are beneficiaries of the intentional exclusions, genocide, and erasure of indigenous peoples. We invite you to join us in honoring the lands we occupy and the histories of their indigenous peoples and paying respect to those communities who remain part of the past, present, and future of the places we now call home. Tonight, we gather on the unceded ancestral homelands of the Onondaga or the people of the Great Hill. In English, they are known as the Seneca people, the keeper of the Western door. Together with the Cayuga, Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, and Tuscarora, the Seneca, the most west, westernmost of the Six Nations, make up the sovereign Haudenosaunee Confederacy. We also acknowledge the people forcibly taken from their ancestral lands in Africa and enslaved to build the economic infrastructure from which this country has long benefited. We furthermore recognize the interconnections between the enduring impacts of colonization, enslavement, and our current climate emergency, which manifest in myriad ways, including habitat destruction and global dispossession, environmental exploitation in indigenous communities and in communities of color, and increasing climate refugee crises. I think this takes on another poignancy with what's going on um, with uh, world leaders this week, or I hope, <laughs> we hope is going on with world leaders this week. So thank you again for being here. Um, again, this program is part of Rochester Reads and Robin Wall Kimmerer's extraordinary book, Braiding Sweetgrass, that has given us, given us so much and resulted in, I think, such rich programming this year. And I'm going to turn it over to Wendy Lowe, who's going to facilitate our panel discussion and introduce you to our guest tonight. Thank you. And I just want to acknowledge that um, I am very pleased and honored to be part of the Rochester Reads program of Writers and Books for the past two decades. Uh, it has brought us to read great contemporary books in depth as a community. And I really feel that it's an important program. Um, it certainly makes me read more carefully um, because I know that there's going to be discussions. Um, <laughs> so I want to introduce to you um, our people who are sharing in this today. And, um, and I'm going to have each of them tell us a little bit about um, what their reaction to the book what is in a little while. But the people who we have with us are Angela Cannon Crothers, Christopher Widmeyer, 
and day star Rosalie Jones. And um, it's, um, it's a great group of people. And I'm going to start by um, introducing Angela because she wants to do um, a wonderful beginning of a program, uh, something called the world's Be Words Before All Else, which is whenever people gather together to think things through, they make sure they do this kind of a Thanksgiving address. So Angela is a, an inviter, environmental educator and writer with over 25 years of experience leading nature awareness programs. Most recently, she was an instructor in environmental science and a writing tutor at Finger Lakes Community College. And she is now the forest and interpretive programs coordinator for school, I'm sorry, an interpretive programs coordinator at RMSC Coming Nature Center. Um, in 2018, she received a grant for a year long program on a sense of place, nature journaling in the time of climate change. Her publications include a novel, a children's book, a nonfiction book on herbs and seasonal activities and numerous articles and essays. Her 2019 book, Changing Seasons in the Finger Lakes, won the award for creative nonfiction with Cayuga Books. She holds a, ma a master's in environmental education, undergraduate degrees in ecology and environmental science. Um, when not mentoring children in primitive skills, field journaling or fairy house building, she can be found, if you've seen fairy houses around writers and books, she, that's her kids. <laughs> she can be found tracking bird calls up local waterfall gullies with her dog or out gathering materials to make whimsical baskets and wild teas. And before we um, get into having her do the address, I just wanna have a little housekeeping issue, which is please put your questions in the Q&A if you can, rather than the chat. Thank you very much. And take it away, Angela. Oh, thank you. Can you hear me OK? OK, so uh, it is really with a great honor um, that I'm here tonight and also sharing the words that come before, which in Haudenosaunee um, and many other Native American traditions was a way to bring people together acknowledging all of creation as being part of why we are here. So this is the Thanksgiving address greetings to the natural world. Today we have gathered and we see that the cycles of life continue. We have been given the duty to live in balance and harmony with each other and all living things. So now we bring our minds together as one as we give greetings and thanks to each other as people. Now our minds are one. We are thankful to our mother, the earth, for she gives us all that we need for life. She supports our feet as we walk upon her. To our mother, we send greetings and thanks. Now our minds are one. We give thanks to all the waters of the world for quenching our thirst and providing us with strength. Water is life. We know its power in many forms. With one mind, we send greetings and thanks to the spirit of water. Now our minds are one. We now toward the turn toward the vast fields of plant life. As far as the eye can see, the plants grow, working many wonders. They sustain many life forms. With our minds gathered together, we give thanks and look forward to seeing plant life for many generations to come. Now our minds are one. Now we turn to all the medicine herbs of the world. From the beginning, they were instructed to take away sickness. They are always waiting and ready to heal us. With one mind, we send greetings and thanks to the medicines and to the keepers of the medicines. Now our minds are one. We gather our minds together to send greetings and thanks to all the animal life in the world. They have many things to teach us as people. We are honored by them when they give up their lives so we may use their bodies as food for our people. We see them near our homes and in the deep forests. We are glad they are still here and we hope that they always will be so. Now our minds are one. We are all thankful to the power we know as the four winds. 
We hear their voices in the moving air as they refresh us and purify the air we breathe. They help us bring the change of seasons. From the four directions they come, bringing us messages and giving us strength. With one mind, we send our greetings and thanks to the four winds. Now our minds are one. We put our minds together and give thanks to the oldest grandmother, the moon, who lights the nighttime sky. She is the leader of women all over the world and she governs the movement of the ocean tine, tides. By her changing face, we measure time and it is the moon who watches over the arrival of children here on earth. With one mind, we send greetings and thanks to our grandmother, the moon. We now send greetings and thanks to our eldest brother, the sun. Each day without fail, he travels the sky from east to west, bringing the light of a new day. He is the source of all the fires of life. With one mind, we send greetings and thanks to our brother, the sun. Now our minds are one. We gather our minds to greet and thank the enlightened teachers who have come to help throughout the ages. When we forget how to live in harmony, they remind us of the way we were instructed to live as people. With one mind, we send greetings and thanks to these caring teachers. Now our minds are one. Now we turn our thoughts to the creator or great spirit and send greetings and thanks for all the gifts of creation. Everything we need to live a good life is here on this mother earth. For all the love that is still around us, we gather our minds together as one and send our choicest words of greetings and thanks to the creator. Now our minds are one. If there is anyone that I, that I have forgotten in this address, please let us acknowledge them now and the importance and the value that they have to each and every one of us on Mother Earth. Thank you. We have now, oh, one more, oh, sorry. We have now arrived at the place where we end our words of all the things we have named. It is not our intention to leave anything out. Our minds are one. Thank you so much, Angie. Next, I'm going to, um, I have a couple of questions for our all three um, panelists. And the first one is about the impact that um, the book had upon you on first reading or second reading and what particular aspects of the book really stuck with you or sections you would really recommend that people read um, or that you would assign to students. And then, you know, in terms of what stuck with you, how has it influenced you? So the book's influence, and I'm gonna to go to Chris Widmeyer for that next. Chris is an educator and the director of Rochester Ecology Partners, a nonprofit that works to improve individual community and environmental well-being by connecting people in our city to nature, the places they live, and one another. Chris, we'd love to hear what you've thought of the book and what it means to you. Thank you very much, Wendy, and, and thank you, Angie and, and Rosalie, um, for being here with me today and, and writers and books for making this happen and everybody that's listening right now. So it's it's good to see you all. And I, I think the first time I, I came in contact with Robin Wall Kimmerer's book was actually her, her book, Gathering Moss. And what really struck me about that was that there were stories woven in with the descriptions of the different moss species. It was a field guide, but written in a completely different way. And that really just caught my attention because I, I had always seen field guides as something that were very dry and very factual. And so to see stories woven in with descriptions of species was really an incredible thing for me. And so then reading the book kind of, you know, when the book came out, I was really excited because then it just continued um, down that path of, of blending different ways of knowing and not treating them as though they were in conflict with each other, but trying to figure out how to blend the different ways of knowing together, and specifically the ways of science and, and traditional ecological knowledge. And so for me as a, as a science teacher, that was a really something I always struggled with was, you know, teaching strictly science when I knew there was a, a deeper, um, a deeper, a, a depth to what we were 
learning about um, that wasn't represented with science, but then also um, to start to have that language and ways of, of thinking about things that could blend them together and see them as, as complementary. But then at the same time, still recognizing the, the differences between the two and acknowledging them. And then the, the other one, you know, in addition to that is just kind of the, the book as a, as a guide for being. And really just, you know, one of the things that she talked about in her lecture was uh, recently was just about the kind of the verbs and how a verb based language versus a noun based language and to really think about, you know, our, our existence here on earth is as something that is a process and was also something that I always was kind of aware of, but gave me a new way to think about how it's, it's life is a process and being who we are is a process rather than a, a, a solid fixed state. So that's my answer to the, the first question of how it impacted me. And Thank you so much, Chris. And now we're going to go to Rosalie Jones, Daystar. Um, it, this is uh, it, one of the things I really like about having put together this panel is I think that these are all people that people in Rochester would want to know are out there doing the good work that they do. And I'm very lucky because although I had heard of and maybe even met once, um, Daystar Rosalie Jones, I am knowing a lot more about her after having put this together. So Daystar Rosalie Jones was born on the Blackfeet Reservation in Montana and acknowledges Pembina Chippewa ancestry as passed through her mother's legacy. Daystar considers herself a dancer, choreographer, teacher, and writer. In 1980, she founded her own company, Daystar Contemporary Dance Drama of Indian America, now recognized to be the first native modern dance company in the USA. Since then, she has created over 30 choreographic works, including Tales of Old Man Napi, which is Blackfeet in origin, The Gift of the Pipe, Lakota, and The Corn Mother, Eastern Cherokee. As a writer, Rosalie Jones scripted the dance drama, No Home But the Heart and other works on contemporary indigenous dance and theater, including Dancing the Four Directions, The Spirit of Intuition and Climbing the Fourth Hill. She was given a Lifetime Achievement Award by the Institute of Indian, American Indian Arts in 2016. As an ongoing commitment, Daystar continues to create unique native-based dance theater. She is also working on a professional and personal memoir, which I'm looking forward to. Um, this year is the 41st year of the Daystar Company. And um, we're, I'm going to put into the chat, um, she has two events coming up in um, November and December. Um, there's a photographic retrospective in the in the multi-use cultural community center art gallery which has already started and goes through December 5th and then there's going to be um, some performances on the third fourth and fifth and I we will go into more details about that later but first I'd like to hear um, her reaction to the book and what it has meant for her Being a novice at <laughs> this, um, thanks to the COVID year, I'm, you know, kicking and screaming and struggling and learning. Uh, so thank you, Wendy, uh, for that introduction. Um, <clears throat> this book by Robin uh, Wall Kimmerer is is a magnificent work of, of art, really. It's writing, it's reminiscence, it's uh, retrospective, it's teaching. It's a lot of teachings that she's bringing forward uh, from indigenous peoples, her own uh, ancestry, uh, as well as others from whom she has learned. And, uh, and I feel that she's a poet, really, because as you read this, her writing, uh, she's a, a, you know, accomplished scientist, uh, but 
she's also an amazing writer. Uh, and you, you can pick up the book on any page and start reading. And it immediately draws you in and you're, you're learning immediately from her. Um, it's amazing to me how she has integrated those traditional teachings with scientific knowledge, um, with stories from the tradition and how those stories embody really the science and the knowledge about the world, plants, animals, uh, how we, how we, as Chris was saying, a kind of a guidebook of uh, how we can move through the world and uh, do as little harm as possible as we uh, as we also interact uh, with uh, with the world. Uh, and I appreciate the fact that Robin was um, making the point that indigenous peoples were scientists, even though it's considered pre-science. Um, but the best example of that is cultivation of corn, which was a tiny little, perhaps, you know, uh, uh, not insignificant, but uh, in its early stages and through human interaction and knowing what that growth process and developmental process um, could be, they brought, you know, the, the indigenous peoples brought us this magnificent uh, uh, sustaining food that is still with us today. Uh, so those are the few things, a few things that stand out for me. Yes, it's fascinating. Corn is the one thing that it can be grown in every state in the country. As I understand it, it is a cash crop in every state in the United States, Alaska, Hawaii, yeah. et cetera. So, and it's been a great gift to people all across the world. Um, as have potatoes, but that's another part of the Americas. Um, the, and about the, the way she writes his poetry, I was, I was joking with my husband, I think you can just kind of take 17 syllables of any of the descriptions and you've got little instant haikus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so now we're gonna go back to Angela because she didn't get a chance to answer this question. How has this impacted you, impacted your work how do you use this book? What does it mean to you? You're muted, Angie. There we go. I read this book the first time um, when it came out around 2013, 2014. And um, as a science teacher, educator, um, and a writer, and someone who feels deeply spiritually connected to the land. I was so moved by this book. I feel like her credibility because she was a scientist um, enabled a, a much wider audience to really um, appreciate the teachings that she had in here and the viewpoints as well. You know, the whole idea of, um, you know, native indigenous language and indigenous understanding is also um, a part of science and they are, it's, it's all ways of knowing. I also, as a writer, um, really um, admired the way she threaded through the whole very dense book with so much in it, um, threaded in the reciprocity, the gratitude, um, as well as uh, ways of becoming indigenous to place and how important that is for all of us who are, who are not, um, you know, that we are alien species here on this land. And <clears throat> she just kept coming back to that and coming back to those three guiding principles um, 
of gratitude, reciprocity, and, and becoming indigenous to place. I have to confess, I actually did get a little fan crazy after I read the book the first time. And I wrote her a letter and um, <clears throat> I tried to get her to see if she would come to FLCC and, and give a talk. Um, and I also wrote her another time about my work, seeing if she would do a forward. I mean, I was, I, I actually researched her scientific papers that she's also published quite a few science papers. <laughs> and I just, I basically like pursued her on the internet for a, quite a while because um, I was just so fascinated uh, with her writing and who she was. I've had the a privilege of being able to attend some of her programs on um, the seventh fire and doing forest bathing with her. But one of the bigger impacts that I think she would appreciate the most um, is the way I've remembered some of the, the techniques and teachings of, you know, um, a rightful harvest, you know, and giving gratitude when you take something and um, learning how, I learned how to gather spruce roots basically from her book. Um, I read a lot of her material uh, to my students. Um, I, I was going to show my black spruce root basket um, quickly. I did a, a workshop with a friend. We did wild crafted baskets. Usually when I make one that I like, I give it away. Um, but this one I have kept. And it was all women. And we read from Robin Wall Kimmerer. This was before COVID, so two or three years ago. And we went out and gathered all of our materials. And at one point, I'm looking under this huge stand of spruce and seeing all these women bent over following the threads of, of spruce roots and untangling them and, and over and under and, and gathering. And just, it was one of the most beautiful things I'd ever seen. And, um, and in Rightful Harvest too, there was another time I was gathering spruce roots and I started wondering, am I taking too much, you know, and I, I don't want to be that person that, you know, takes more than half or, or, is, or is not being grateful. And I actually felt the trees um, sighing and giving thanks back to me. I, I got the impression that they were feeling like finally they were having a, a person interact with them and that was what they needed and they wanted to be pruned and they wanted to be used. And, and that was, um, a pretty remarkable experience as well. So a lot of what she's written has directly been an experience, impactful experience in my life. Um, mm -hmm. And then the other big impactful part was the language of animacy, which um, I really think if we were consciously aware of acknowledging the beingness of clouds and air and water, um, and in some countries they have, they've acknowledged the beingness of, of a lake or a river in order to protect it, um, but that it really could change our world um, if we could take on that language of animacy. And um, she published in Orion in 2017, um, a more extended version of that language of animacy. And you can, you can usually find it on the internet. Um, however, my son is a linguistics graduate from Cornell and um, he does say that we need to be cautious about thinking that ling uh, it's called linguistic determinism, but we have to be cautious with assuming that a language can influence a mindset. But that's where I think like consciously, maybe we could. So I've used a lot of this in, in writing classes as well. So yeah, she's been very influential in my life for about seven years. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, I have to say that um, one of the one of the uh, barriers, I think, to us referring to other living things in the same way we refer to humans is that we then would have to gender plants because we don't say anything about humans without gendering, which makes this whole um, push towards non-gendered pronouns really interesting because it would allow us to use the same kind of language and um you know because we have a gendered language and then we don't have a gendered language in that pine doesn't have a gender the way it would in german or spanish but that's a whole right, other right. discussion 
it's a whole nother discussion. Uh, one of the things I really appreciate about this book is that she is from this area and therefore almost every, she writes about other places, but a lot of it is about land that anybody who is reading it from this area will recognize the plants and the animals and feel mm -hmm. at home in the book. Um, so the second question is, how do you as yourself in your own um, professional and personal life reciprocate the gift of breath and nurturance on this planet? I love the idea that, that um, she puts somewhere where the trees and the, uh, the, the environment says, oh, here come the people who give thanks. <laughs> um, I, that, you know, that makes sense to me. I, I come from a, a family that are of, of educators on my mother's side who are always noticing the beautiful and the wonderful and giving, giving praise to it. And, um, that feels just exactly right to me. Um, but beyond, do you do that? And then beyond that, how else do you see yourself able to reciprocate the gift of life on this earth? That's a tough one. I'm not. I'm not saying it isn't. But um, Chris, are you still with us? You're back I'm, with us. I know I'm, you lost electricity. Yeah, that was kind of interesting. The electricity in my house just flashed, and I, I left, but now I'm back. So yeah, I'm here, and and um, yeah. So I missed a little bit of what was said, but uh, it's going to be. Of, it's recorded. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but I. I this was an interesting question to think about, and my, my best answer to that is is one teaching, um, and you know, as an educator and somebody who has has worked really hard to get others outside and experiencing um, the world around them and and building relationships with each other, and also you know trying to to focus all of that on kind of the the recipro reciprocal relationship between our relationship with each other and our relationship with the world around us and, and nature and how that can lead us to to grow in community um, again with with the world you know the living things that we share the world with but but each other and and I also think just that idea of give and take and so an awareness of there are times when I'm going to be giving and there's an awareness of a, a time that I'm going to be taking and thinking and being very conscious about that thought of that, that what, what am I taking, how much am I taking, and then also what am I giving and, and how much am I giving and really trying to be aware of that. And then the, the other part is just that, that reciprocation is just to, I don't know, to, I, you know, it's interesting there what are you know thinking about language is what is that language and that's you know just is a I think love is the best word and that's just to show as much love as I can for um both the, the earth and and everything that, that gives me life and who I am and all of the people um, and so that's that's my best answer to that and and also um I think thinking about stewardship and that perspective I think one of the things that that kind of the love and stewardship and where those kind of interplay with each other in interesting ways is that stewardship is, a, is of a place is about care but there's often a perspective of ownership um, in the way that people talk about stewardship but I, I think you know the deeper perspective of you know we are we are of the land we are of the biological communities we are of the spirit of life that is all around us. And so, you know, how do we make sure that we nurture that and 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 increase it, increase abundance? I think that's the other part that I want to make sure I get to as I'm talking here is that seeing seeing the world and its gifts as abundant and that my role is to both live in that abundance, but do what I can to increase uh, that abundance. And that that's <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll move now to um, Rosalie, if you would like to go next. Can you unmute and we'll... Yes, yes. Um, uh, you know, I think that's the, this is the beauty of this book uh, is that, as Angela was saying, there's so much in it. Uh, 
so very many different aspects of from which to uh, view it and draw from draw from what she's writing. Um, much of what she's saying in the book, uh, I have met before in other places, either from uh, from teachings that, that I heard from my mother and grandmother. Uh, or from other indigenous teachers that I've met along along the way. Um, and it's very interesting to me that, well, I my profession is dance, choreography, uh, but I am also a teacher. And I feel really that uh, over the years, I've felt that teaching is more important than performing. <laughs> and, you know, performing is wonderful and it has its own, um, its own messages that it gives us and uh, reasons for doing it, uh, both for yourself and for those who come to view the performance. I mean, it's always a two-way street. But in teaching, uh, I've found that um, drawing from indigenous knowledge, as Robin is uh, talking about it in many various levels, um, is, is a way to uh, to embody those teachings. We, we use that term a lot in dance, embody, because you take it into your body. And of course, it's not just body, it's body and mind and spirit. I mean, it's, it's one's whole self that you bring to, um, to learning and teaching. Um, for instance, uh, if I'm in a studio in a room working with students, uh, we'll be standing in a circle, not with me at the head of the class and then everybody in rows imitating what I do. Rather, uh, I've incorporated these uh, values into my teaching. So we, we, we sit or stand in a circle so we are all equal and we can see each other. And um, uh, I always tell the students, uh, usually the first thing we do is uh, be aware that even if you're inside a building, it's as if you are outside standing on the earth and your feet feel the earth. And you feel the energy coming out of the earth into your body. And, and then that's a way of centering oneself, uh, closing the eyes, becoming aware of the breath. So we would not be alive if we weren't breathing air in and out. Um, and from that point, we're using uh, body, mind, spirit, and breath to embody whatever it is we're going to be doing. It might be ex exploring uh, the movement of the wind, uh, the movement of an animal, um, the idea of of creation, destruction, recreation, um, the cycle, cycles of life. So um, I've incorporated these uh, uh, concepts, value systems uh, into the way I teach. And uh, I was fortunate to work for 12 years at Trent University in Peterborough, Ontario, Canada, 
in the Indigenous Studies program, which had an Indigenous Performance Studies program. And it was, uh, it was a situation in which I learned as much as, as the students were learning. Uh, we were progressing together through this. We would go outside when we could and walk through the environment, <coughs> um, noticing, paying attention to rocks, water, a creek, uh, leaves, uh, rocks, inanimate objects as well, but that have their place as well. Uh, so I, I think this brings us back to one of the um, one of the um, notions that Robin is incorporating throughout the book, which is living through our senses. And I think in Western the Western world, in Western society, in Western ways of learning. Uh, we have become so uh, so uh, <clears throat> heavy ended on the academic uh, intellectualism that we've forgotten about the body and the senses and that we learn through the senses. So I found that all the way through Robin's book, uh, seeing, being able to see, to hear, to touch, to smell, uh, and to taste. She's talking about those, uh, uh, those ways of paying attention all the time. So those, those were, those are things that, uh, uh, I appreciated in her writing. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> what you were saying made me think of the school that uh, my son went to, which was better than some, but still a public school, and how sense how they purposely make so much of our school day um, sensorily numbing, if that makes any sense. Um, so yeah, yeah, very interesting. Um, we have one more person to answer, and then we're going to go into Q and A. Um, so Angie's going to answer, and then we're going to go into Q and A and go into more depth on what your questions are in the audience. So if you have questions, feel free to put them in the Q and A. They won't pop up for people, but they'll be there when we're ready to ask questions. Go ahead, Angela. Yeah. So um, you'd think that giving gratitude wouldn't be such a hard thing. <laughs> um, or, or realizing what you're grateful for. But I find that most people really do have to stop and think um, about what we're grateful for. And there's so much each and every day. And I believe Kimmerer was showing us that reciprocity, um, she has it, you know, everything, there's big things that we can show re uh, great gratitude for. But there was all sorts of reciprocity that were just the simplest little things like rescuing, you know, helping salamanders cross the road. That's a huge gift of reciprocity. Um, planting a garden, because I mean, at first I had to go through, what do I do? I don't know what I do, which is silly because, you know, of course we all do a lot, but um, buying local foods, um, having a compost pile, um, you know, giving thanks for your food. I, I just love the image of her father pouring the coffee on the ground, you know, um, every morning and just just taking a moment to pause and acknowledging your being and all the beings around you and how connected you are um, is an act of reciprocity as well. So I think that uh, she shows that we can all do the littlest things and they are all very, very big things um, to boot, so yeah. Okay, so um, I have one question in the Q&A, and that is, I am curious about how the panelists address the question of avoiding the conflation 
of cultural appropriation with the adoption of indigenous worldview and practices that are vital in transforming our dominant culture of harm to one that centers belonging, reciprocity, solidarity, and care. And this is a very interesting question to me because um, one of the interesting things with the, um, this is from Sarah in the audience. And one of the interesting things for me with the um, Thanksgiving address is um, at least the people um, who, who I know it from like Jake Swamp, make it very clear that they think that this is a, a gift to the world, that, um, that it is a beautiful thing that was developed within their culture, but that the world needs it and they want it out there. Um, so, you know, I think probably it would be most interesting to have um, Rosalie answer this. How do, do you feel like people you know, because it is, it, 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 there's been some stuff like with um, protests and things like that. The question of when are you, when are you appropriating and when are you adopting because it, it feels like the right way to go and, and what kind of permissions need to be there, I guess, is one of, part of the question. Go ahead. Rosalie. Yeah, it's a very, that? it's a very important question. Uh, and, uh, and equally difficult to answer. Um, but we do have to um, address uh, uh, misdirected cultural appropriation. Um, and of course, it's, it's been going on for actually hundreds of years. Uh, uh, by those who are not aware that um, uh, within cultures and within clans and within families, um, there is ownership of, for instance, dances or songs or stories um, and other ways of, of uh, meeting one's cultural uh, obligations, say, throughout the year, uh, which forms a ceremonial year. Um, uh, it's a big subject uh, and it's very broad. I mean, I'm, one thinks about the mascot uh, issue that's slowly being resolved now. Uh, over a period of years, um, and but finally, you know, people, those having appropriated uh, those cultural icons, uh, are slowly waking up to the fact that well, maybe this is not uh, the right thing to do, uh, and and it's again, it's. Um, It's, it seems to be never across the board that it will be completely eliminated. Um, but uh, I think generally what I could say is that permissions do need to be um, secured. Uh, and I think there's two sides of the coin here because some of, of this, well, a good deal of the interest in uh, indigenous culture and ways of doing things is becoming more, uh, more. Uh, there's more attention being paid to it. That the these are things that we need to that we can learn from. Um, So one, one part of this is, uh, I think uh, maybe I could say it this way. 
there, there are many levels of uh, cultural appropriation uh, or cultural uh, identity. Um, and the surface of it is very, uh, is very thin. And it's what appears on the surface of, say, for instance, uh, what could it be? Uh, Potawatomi people or uh, um, Lakota people, uh, a Lakota language, Lakota um, uh, culture. But then as you go deeper into the culture, other, there are other layers, deeper layers of meaning. And uh, the deeper we go into the culture, the more, uh, the more cautious and we have to be with these teachings and the, um, uh, the use or misuse of, of what that is. Um, but I, I wanted to make the point of, uh, of a story that comes from Lakota people called uh, White Buffalo Calf Pipe Woman. And this is a story of the woman who, uh, uh, at a specific period of time in Lakota history, uh, appeared on the plains one day and she brought to the people the gift of the pipe. And she came in the form of a buffalo. Uh, and uh, this pipe is still uh, with the people and it's kept by the pipe keeper and it's kept in a very special place that only certain people know about and it's brought out at a certain time of the year uh, in order to uh, ceremonial, ceremonially recognize the people, uh, this gift again. Um, but this story from, from the Lakota um, was was kept in the family, I mean, for since it appeared uh, originally. But now the elders are saying, we need to bring this story out. And it needs to be heard by everyone who is willing to hear it so that we can learn, everyone can learn from this story. And I feel that's a very important point that an elder is making that we're at a point in, in our history on the earth when we need to learn from indigenous peoples as much as we can, as broadly as we can and as deeply as we can. And these are teachings that that can be to the benefit of mankind in general, uh, to all peoples. So that's a, a very uh, circuitous way of, I guess, approaching this, this idea. But um, I think the, f the first um, uh, principle is to have respect to pay respect to the people, to their culture, to their teachings, um, to their ways of knowing. Mm -hmm. and, and to learn, if you are wanting to learn, to learn directly from those people, from the elders, from the dancers, from the storytellers, not secondhand from, this is a, mm -hmm. this is a song, and I'm going to learn the song and pass it on over here, and then it's going to pass on over there. And that that is, I think, what doesn't work because the um, the, the identity and the strength 
of the culture becomes uh, diluted. So one has to go always back to the source. I, I really like what you're saying there. One of the things that it reminds me about is that with an oral culture, um, you're always getting your information in the presence of the person who's giving yeah. it to you. Whereas with a written culture, there's all this interpretation that can happen without the person being there to say, no, actually, you know, you, mm -hmm. it, what, what is meant here is this. And, um, you know, you have to approach, it, it, it's approaching it with you, you have to approach with humility when you've got another human being in front of you who is the mm -hmm. knowledge keeper. Whereas with yeah. um, written or recorded stuff, people just kind of run with it in their own imagination or their own ego and make it what they want. So I think that's really, that's really interesting to think about. I mean, we have a tendency to think that our, that writing as it, I mean, I'm, I'm an English major, you know, I understand the, the, that writing is a huge technological invention, but it doesn't take the place of getting it from the source, like you say. Mm -hmm. Um, did um, either of you have any comments on that? Um, or should we move to more stuff you know, from the... Uh... I, wanna, I wanna build on that a little bit, Wendy, if I could. Sure. And, and that, just that idea, I was thinking a little bit about one of the, one of the things that it, it really starts with is just figuring out what is right for the, the people around you and how, the, how the, the community that you're directly a part of is building a sense of, of who they are and what it means to live in right relationship to the world. And so there's often kind of this, like, we're going to look outside to figure out what to do, which is important. And I do have a link because that's kind of one of my other answers to the question is, is looking at what conversations people are having today. And, and recently, Yes Magazine um, came out with this whole, whole um, mm. say, episode mm -hmm. issue about how we can live in, a, in an ecological civilization. And, and it's a modern answer to these, these questions that people have been asking forever, is, is how do we live the right way? And so, you know, taking ideas that are coming from other places, but what it really comes down to is, is the people that are around you and the opportunities that you have and the invitations that you have. I, I think, you know, Ganandagan is a place that invites people in to have these conversations and learn from them um, and specifically for educators. And so that, that's a way to go. But then I think the other answer I have to that is that kind of like, what are, what are the universal things that you're really trying to get at? And this kind of, you know, what, what can we learn? You know, if Robin Wall Kimmerer talks about learning from the plants and asking the plants what we should be doing. And in, in the chapter, I, I back to like what we would recommend people read that she's got in the footsteps of non bozo and I don't know if that's the correct pronunciation but becoming indigenous to place and she talks about how the goal is to be naturalized not to replicate the experience of being indigenous it's it's to try to figure out what it means to be rooted in your place and what that means in the way that you live um and and I was also reflecting a little bit on the kind of my, my science mind of these answers, these questions have been very list oriented. Um, but then in the, in the spirit of some, some better storytelling, um, I was just out uh, in the Adirondacks for four days with young people from a high school and um, campfires were the number one thing they said in addition to hiking that they wanted to have. And I, I, I love the experience of, of having a campfire and telling stories and singing songs and laughing because it, it really, returns, you know, I, I feel some sort of return to a, a, a natural state of who I am and, and who we are, more importantly, in community. And we, and we don't need, you know, we, we don't need the, to take rituals from other cultures to do that. We, we don't need to have some sort of, of song that we sing that's from another language um, that isn't ours or something that, that we can find ways for that to be our own, you know, to sit around with these young people and, and have them rap about being in the woods is part of that interpretation of that experience that is real and authentic and that, that brings us to the place that 
any any desire we would have to incorporate other cultures or whatever into the experiences it's just finding out what way works for us and that's authentic to who we are and, and where we are and, and but that you know that the campfire is just one of those things that you know also out in Seneca Park with a group of young people from Northeast um, High School and we we had somebody start a, a campfire there and a, and a just a you know kind of like a, a fire pit sort of thing and the and the just the natural gravitation that people had to that um, these young people that were going to go back to school smelling like a campfire um, they 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 didn't care they were gravitated towards it and there were conversations that were happening that were at a depth that wouldn't have happened in any other way and again because it's it's back to those kind of deeper truths of who we are and, and what we can learn from the world and that kind of that gift that the the fire gives us that the wood burning is a gift to all of us and so thinking of it that way I think is also helpful so um Angela, you may have something to add to this, but um, uh, Sarah, 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 that was a great question. That was um, from uh, Sarah. Now we have another from Carol D'Agostino uh, comment, and I'm coming to you, Angela, because it's got a rondequoit in it. <laughs> I feel that her book filled a hole in my spirit. For years, I struggled with the religion which di didn't fit. I declared nature as my spiritual world, but couldn't define what I meant. Robin filled that hole tremendously with her book. Growing up in Irondequoit, I had a history of the Iroquois and Senecas, but never learned about the deep spiritual component of being a Native American. What a loss for not teaching that in the schools. I really don't have a question, but would love to hear the panel's thoughts on this. And I think that some of what you were talking about it's very interesting. One of the things that Angela hasn't didn't put in her bio is that her senior project, she was a school that wall student, was spending a lot of time in the woods um, between Arundaquoit and Rochester. Um, what's the name of that? You can talk about it, Angela. But the idea that there's everybody here is a teacher of some sort or another that there was not enough information about the indigenous um, spirituality and the depth of their culture, that part, and also bring what, what, what um, Chris is saying, bringing us back to our own ideas of what it means to be in relationship with the land and with each other in a more, um, in a way that goes back to nature that is the way we've done it for millennia. I just wonder what your comments on that, any of that is, Angela. Sorry to dump all that on you. Well, I'm I'm I love the becoming indigenous to place and and the idea of the um, the plantain being representative of of a species that um, it didn't become truly invasive. It is an alien species. It becomes naturalized and and offers its own gifts. And I think that is what the call for reciprocity for all of us who are here and it's not our native home. I mean, that is, you know, we need to give back a gift, but hearing you a couple of things that you were saying reminded me of several times when I have um, been talking with indigenous peoples and they say, look to your ancestors, look to your ancestry and see what that culture is. And there are so many, um, you know, the Kel like I'm, I'm from a Celtic background and that's a, a far Northern background and, and the ancient traditions are very much embodied and, and in, in, imbued with nature and with natural nature spiritualism, I guess you would call it, or paganism, some people call it, but the people were in tune with the seasons, the seasonal changes, the um, the land, uh, and, and that I think is what it's really about, about, that so many of us can go back to our personal ancestry um, and see where, where it aligns with how we're feeling and, and what we're finding that's appealing um, in the indigenous. And we might find that we really all are indigenous somewhere, <laughs> you know, yeah. that we have that background um, deep within our own spirits. And yeah, I, 
you know, I just, I definitely a whole, you know, agree with this person who said they did, they were looking for religion and, and they were finding it much more in nature because nature is spirit. It is full of energy. It is far more connected to the creator than we are consciously aware because we are so busy with being human and all the things we think that are so important. Um, whereas I think the plants and the animals and the rocks and the stream tell us to stop and reconnect and feel that, you know, that, that thread, that, that web that connects us all. So this has been do, being done webinar style, so I can't see all the audience, which um, it doesn't doesn't feel quite right to me. And I don't know if that can be adjusted at this point. Um, I'm asking the tech people who are in the background there whether we can <laughs> <laughs> yeah whether whether that's a possibility. But um, I want to bring up a question, and I, and I think it has. Um, Chris and Angie and I are, are working on a, a possible project around this, but one of the things I feel very strongly um, from living in the city for a long time and watching um, my ch child's friends and my friends um, living in an urban environment and having bit, okay. One of the things that I think is really hugely tragic about um, for, for many of the people who live in Rochester is that they came from other places as either immigrants or they were fleeing something and they've never, but they came straight to the city or they came up from the South where um, African-Americans, um, had learned the land there, but then were being um, harassed off of it. And they came directly to cities. And so for, they don't have, one of the things with my family is, my family is from New Hampshire and we still go to New Hampshire in the summers. And so I have an extreme privilege of spending time in a place where there's very little other than um, trees. <laughs> and, um, and so one of the things I see with um, our kids, even our suburban kids, is this lack of having spent any time actually just wandering in a natural environment. And um, with our African-American kids, their families have been ripped twice from environments to which they were feeling indigenous and now are living in places where, because they're living in that part of town, they don't necessarily take as good care of the trees. The city doesn't, you know, they don't fix the curbs and they don't plant the nicest trees and they don't have enough parks. And what do we do? It, it, you know, we're talking about feeling more indigenous and, and we're sort of probably preaching to the choir here because most of us are here because we're interested in this book and we're interested in this subject. How do we help our next generations reconnect to nature when maybe even their parents have been disconnected? It's, it's, and for me, I think nature teaches people not only how to be in nature, but how to think and ask questions and notice things. I think it's intellectually important but it's so spiritually important right now, especially. So I'm going to shut up and see what you guys' answers are. Who wants to go first? Anybody? I, Just I, I, yeah, I, I mean, you know, you know, this is something that I, I think about a lot and do a lot of work around. And I, I think kind of goes back to the step one is, is thinking of ourselves and, and as belonging here, no matter who we are, we are, we're people. And that was one of the things kind of that I've applied to my, my teaching in my life from this book is that, you know, she talks about the, this tells the story of when she was teaching a class and ask people what things people have done to earth. And they all come up with a list of all of these negative things and can't think of one positive thing that it means to be a person on this earth. And I think so often, especially in cities, people 
talk about that. And I, I do believe that, you know, our language and what we talk about and how we talk about it does influence our mind and our way of being as well as well as our experiences. But so often that's people talk about the city as a place where there's no connection to nature and talk about people that live in the city without having a connection to nature and, and you use reconnect. And I, I think that's an, an important kind of framework to start with is that the, the connection is there and it's just an, a, a relearning of our connection and, and also seeing this city as a place where there is nature to connect to. It, it's not a lot, but again, it goes to this kind of Eurocentric idea and, and this that there's wilderness out there and the rest of it is is not um, is the opposite, and and there's it's more of a gradient. You know, I, I'm I'm I live here in the city, and we talk about you know gardening and things. I was really excited to see some some turkey tail um, fungus growing on some old logs I have behind my garage, and those are growing wild. That that little corner behind my garage is a wilderness, and I remember growing up um, behind the garage and and alongside the garage. Um, you know, that, that that was a small patch of wilderness. And so starting to think about those sorts of things of, of where do we find, you know, wild and, and nature in the city. And then, but then also to not stop there. And I also think that it is important to do whatever we can to bring young people into experiences that show them what, you know, a forest is. And, and I, I was thinking about the reciprocity question, you know, I, Anytime I can bring a group of people to meet Angie, uh, I know I've done some of my job because that means we're out at the Coming Nature Center and you know we're, we're in the woods learning from her. Um, and, and then the same is true for the, you know, that, that seeing a, 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 a night of stars without much light and seeing a million stars just scattered across the sky is an experience that everyone needs to have and that we need to, we need to orient our education system towards that. And how do we provide rich experience? You talked about the numbing of senses. And I, I was talking to some teachers today as we were walking up in Cobbs Hill, Washington Grove, they're teachers at School 15. And we, we were just talking about that, about how students by, you know, by the, the end of the afternoon, you know, get really squirrely or tired or whatever. And a lot of that is just about how there's their spirits and that, that need for, you know, the world to be part of their lives is just stripped from them in a classroom. So then how do we make sure that more of their experience is one that engages all of their senses beyond the five senses, their sense of wonder, their sense of excitement and, and awe. And so those are things that I think are, are essential, essential to that. And, and again, it's universal, you know, for suburban young people, there, there's this idea that, um, you know, the suburbs are somehow full of nature in a way that the city isn't, but you know, the mo for most young people, a parking lot and asphalt is, is their most, you know, their environment that they're most connected to outside of a building, you know, and, and that's, you know, they step out of a car onto a pavement and into a building and that's universal for lots and lots of children. And so we need to also think of it like that, that it's something that all children need to be given the opportunity for. Um, so I think other people have something to say, but I just want you to know I'm putting into the chat um, something that uh, Rosalie sent me on references on Native American oral traditions and teachings. And if any of you want any of the things that have been in the chat, we'll save the chat and um, we can send it out to you because um, they know it's sometimes hard for people to copy things from chats, but I'm just going to send that out. Did you, anybody else want to address that? Rosalie, Angela? I, I just wanted to quickly reiterate what, what Chris was saying. And, and, and Wendy, you know this too, because we've done this outdoors with kids before and that nature is everywhere. Um, you can find, you know, medicine plants, you can find edible plants, you can find birds and bugs and turkey tail mushrooms. Oh my gosh, that is so cool. <laughs> um, and yeah, nature is constantly trying to get our attention, even if you are uh, in downtown and putting up bird feeders and encouraging kids to 
plant, you know, pots of tomatoes and doing that with them is really engaging them um, with the natural world. But even more, and just as important, is getting kids outside. Um, it, it doesn't have to be the woods. It doesn't have to be, you know, it can, it can be the schoolyard, but just giving kids more outdoor time um, and a little bit more unstructured outdoor time um, is just so important. I, I just have to tell, uh, say this, uh, Chris had my son in high school, but when he was in first grade and they stopped going outside every single day, they stopped going out like they did in kindergarten. He only got through whole day kindergarten because they went outside every day. He was, it was his first um, social revolution. He was going to, he was going to start the revolution on making sure that first graders could go outside every day, just like the kindergartners. Um, Rosalie, did you want to say something? Well, <laughs> um, I, you know, I would reiterate what Angela and Chris are saying about nature is everywhere, even if it's only a little piece of it, uh, maybe we, we can't step out to a full forest, but there are other things if we pay attention. Uh, I mean, ants on a sidewalk uh, can be really fascinating. Uh, and, you know, a worm coming up after it rains. Uh, I think, Nature is there if we really pay attention to seeing it. Um, uh, I don't know if there's another question, but uh, uh, the getting outside is very important. Uh, I, I really do wanna mention um, uh, well, in the book, uh, Robin talks about Eddie Benton Benet, uh, whom, uh, who, whom I knew, uh, he's now passed on, but, uh, as a person who, uh, was of course totally immersed in his culture, uh, but also founded the Red Schoolhouse in St. Paul, Minnesota. And he did that because he realized that uh, the young people were not getting what they should be getting in the public schools uh, as far as certainly Red Schoolhouse was able to introduce a study of language and to keep that going and part of their lives every day. Um, uh, but fitting into the curriculum, uh, indigenous uh, teachings, uh, whether it would be science, mathematics, uh, literature, whatever it was, that it had a component uh, associated with it that addressed uh, Native American or indigenous first peoples, uh, knowledge, teachings, history, culture. And certainly the public schools generally are, are not doing their job on that front. Um, apparently, as I understand that there are units, a unit of <laughs> um, Native American history or uh, whatever it might be, uh, only in certain grades. So that you get, maybe it's fourth grade and then eighth grade and then 12th grade. And it, it's totally minimal and totally in, in, inadequate. And, you know, these systems are set up, you know, over 
you know, 50, 75 years ago, and nobody's really, really uh, taken on the initiative and the responsibility um, and to, to have our children, whether you're native or non-native or immigrant, whatever it is, have a basic understanding of indigenous peoples, first peoples of this uh, country of North America. Uh, and it's no wonder that we have the racial divide that we have by the time students get through the 12th grade and have very little understanding of, of, of how to relate uh, socially, uh, uh, interculturally, um, and historically. Uh, and there's just uh, so much that needs to be done uh, in the public school education across the board. I think if if that one element were to become a reality, we would have a very different society in which we live uh, now, yeah. Thank you so much for that. I do wanna say also, I'm putting one other thing in here. Um, I said I would give you more detail in the chat um, about the upcoming um, art show, photographic, um, it's a photographic retrospective of the Daystar Company. Is that what it is, Rosalie? Yes, yes, 41 and years of the company. And it's it's some actual artwork uh, by indigenous artists uh, and also production uh, photographs and uh, significant people. And part of that are the mentors that, um, I was fortunate to have, such as Eddie Benton Benet, uh, Edna Manitowabi, uh, you know, traditional people as well as uh, Jose Lamon and other people in the modern dance world. Uh, and that that is up now. And uh, usually you can view it by, you know, before or after a performance at the Multicultural Center, MUC in Rochester and it'll be up all month. And then uh, Daystar will be doing three nights of performances, Friday night, December 3rd, Saturday afternoon at three o'clock and Sunday afternoon at three o'clock with a reception. And I really encourage kids to come. I mean, bring your kids. These are stories from Native America that they, they will enjoy. So I just put that in the chat, stories stories of Turtle Island on stage. Yes. yes. December 3rd, 4th and 5th. And if you've never been to the multi-use uh, community cultural center, also known as Muck, um, yes. it's a wonderful <laughs> place to see something because it's very intimate uh, theater yes. space. Yes. Small and friendly. Exactly. All are welcome. <laughs> Yes. So I wanted to say Andrea Porter um, had to leave and gave her thanks. I'm going to call out who else is in the audience. We have Carol D'Agostino, Elizabeth, whose last name is not up here. We have Jim Widmeyer, Roberta McElroy, Sally Bittner Bond. Hi, Sally. No questions? <laughs> and Susan Holmesy. So thank you all for coming. Any I'll, more? I'll say thanks specifically to my dad. Jim Widmeyer is my dad. <laughs> I'm sure my mom's there too. So good to see you both. And again, this is going to be recorded and will be available. So if you really got a lot out of it and you feel like you want to either watch it again or share it with people, it will be available. Um, if there are no more questions, we can probably go back to whatever it is we do at night before we have to go to bed and get up the next morning and do what we do the next day. <laughs> but remember and, to be grateful I, about it. <laughs> I, I wanna just say a big thank you, speaking of gratitude to Robin Wall Kemmerer for her magnificent book that I think is, is gonna be around for a long time and, and is uh, an important piece of writing. 
Yeah, yeah I, I, I agree with you. And um, again, if you've never participated in Rochester Reads before, I, ha I have to tell you, um, Karen does a lot of the selecting and she does a wonderful job of coming up with things that will invigorate good discussion in the community and are well worth reading. Um, and um, I don't, I'd seen this book, but I hadn't read it. And ha had they not made it the Rochester Reads book, I don't know when I would have gotten, I, you know, I could turn my, my computer and you would see this wall of books. I don't know when I would have gotten to it and I'm so glad I did get to it, so. Much gratitude to you as well, Wendy, for hosting this and to Karen for all the hard work you've been doing. And um, it was such a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Thank you, yeah, I echo that. And it was wonderful to have all these wonderful people in the same place and uh, hopefully we will all cross cross paths again. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, writers and books. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we we couldn't do it without you as participants and all the readers. And uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm very grateful that this book exists, as you were saying, and I'm grateful that um, in choosing it, it, it um, became a really kind of canonical Rochester Reads book now. Um, and I'll have to try and at least equal it next year. We'll see. Uh -huh. <laughs> good. Well, good, good challenge. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is indeed. Well, you know, I'm always willing to be a second reader on ones that you like. <laughs> this, there was, there was no need this time. This was, this was braiding sweetgrass and it was, it was a no brainer. So yeah. Yeah. It's all so right. special to me and so many. Thank you all. Thank you all. So, um, I guess, am I the host? Are you the host? Who's the host? Who gets to Dan. say it's over? <laughs> oh, Dan. Night, Dan. Dan, the background man. He thinks everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Peace.